I love to connect with the Chinese ancestors, some of the more earlier Zen teachings. And part of that is I mostly have no idea what Dogen's talking about. And I'm not always sure Dogen knew what Dogen was talking about. <laughs> so the clarity of people like Chan Master Pai Chong speaks to me. And Pai Chong was, is the person who is known for creating the first body of rules for the Zen community to practice together. And we're still following some of those same guidelines, at least in spirit. So this is from his collected record. Let's see, and a student asked Master Pai Chang, I think Japanese pronounce it Bai Zhang, what is the essential method for sudden enlightenment in the great vehicle? The master said, you all should first put an end to all involvements and lay to rest all concerns. Do not remember or recollect anything at all, whether good or bad, mundane or transcendental. Do not engage in thoughts. Let go of body and mind. Set them free. I love that. It's not devaluing this. It's set them free. With mind like a mountain, not explaining anything with the mouth, mind not going anywhere, then the mind ground becomes like space, wherein the sun of wisdom naturally appears. It is as though the clouds had opened and the sun emerged. With mind like mountain, firm, not discriminating, not moving, mind not going anywhere. This is a very, very good instruction. Awareness does not travel. That's our sense of dualistic consciousness. But awareness just put an end to all fettering connections and feelings of greed, hatred, craving, defilement, and purity all come to an end. The body of nowness. In the body of nowness, we disconnect from the fettering connections. Unmoved in the face of the five desires, and I think that means the five desires to see beautiful things or to not see ugly things, to smell beautiful things or not smell displeasurable things and so forth. Unmoved in the face of the five desires and the eight worldly winds, not choked up by seeing, hearing, discerning, or knowing, not confused by anything, naturally endowed with virtue and the inconceivable use of spiritual powers, this is someone who is free. In the presence of all things in the environment, to have a mind neither still nor disturbed, neither concentrated nor distracted, passing through all sound and form without lingering or obstruction, this is called being a wayfarer. Not setting in motion even good, definitely not evil, right or wrong, not clinging to a single thing, not rejecting a single thing, is called being a member of the Mahayana. Not bound by any good or evil, emptiness or existence, defilement or purity, doing or non-doing, is called enlightened wisdom. Once affirmation and negation, like and dislike, approval and disapproval, variously the preferential mind, all the various opinions and feelings come to an end <coughs> and cannot bind you. Then you are free wherever you may be. This is called a bodhisattva at the moment of inspiration immediately ascending to the stage of Buddhahood. It's Master Bai Zhang. So something hard to define calls us. 
something hard to define hums inside of us. Something hard to define flirts with us, leaps through the gaps of habitual mind, looks through our eyes with innocence, Something outside of controls grasping quietly purrs in our bodies. Something rouses us back from the floating daydream. Wakes us out of victim mind. Unbinds us from resentment. And whether you would frame it as seeking awakening or the divine or liberation, what is it that human beings are doing and looking for and finding but not fully? In a way, if you look at culture, it's a big junk ground, a big, what are they called? A big landfill of partially fulfilled desires. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a landfill. What is it that we're doing and looking for and finding but not fully when we go for a hike beyond the exercise and the scenery? When we go to look at art? When we're drawn to listen to a piece of music? What is it that's so delicious about sleep? What is it we really desire about having sex or longing to be having sex? What are we really looking for when socializing and seeking to be seen or however temporary having the aspiration to see others? What are we looking for when we work hard to provide security for self and loved ones in the midst of this charnel ground of reality where we know that security is a sham, snake oil? What are we looking for when we work for justice in a world where power shifts from one place to another unendingly for centuries? up and down? What are we looking for when we make art? What are we desiring when we scour books and blogs and scroll? What is the heart doing when it's dreaming? What is it human beings are doing and looking for and finding but never fully? thought it was there, but now that I'm here, it's not, it's not here. I thought it might be there, but now that I'm there, it's not quite there. That's like the cliff notes on the average human life. What is the appetite that the restaurant of the world never sates? Never sates. There are many sophisticated ideas about Buddhist meditation and some of them sync right up with our desire just to check out and not have to be deeply honest with ourselves. But it seems to me that the Buddhist path consistently a liberative path of meditation that is essentially shamatha and vipassana. <coughs> and that's been articulated in many different ways in different traditions. There's a venerable Chinese tradition that's significant influence on what we do, or the practice is stopping and seeing, they call it. 
We could say rest and illumination, stable presence and incisive non-conceptualness. And to go into the weeds, one way to talk about vipassana is it's about, it's an invitation into seeing the emptiness of self and things. Self empty of thing, things empty of their being something there apart from moments of mind. And both the word moment and both the word mind are words with no referent. They're untouchables, they're allegories, they're rafts at best. And Dogen Zenji says, mountains neither exist nor don't exist, are neither large nor small. Vipassana as a way to orient one's practice is to say that I have this spiritual longing. I know that my appetites have not been, will not be satisfied by the supermarket of the culture. And therefore I'm going to use my vitality, specifically my dissatisfaction and my spiritual longing to try to see if there's anything else. That's the basic proposition of spiritual traditions is, yes, your intuition is correct, there is something else. Yes, despite fashionable philosophical arguments, yes, there is something else, but the idea of it doesn't slate your thirst. The seeming suffering that vibrantly sucks isn't extinguished by anything in our conditioned, impermanent world. I know many of you have been practicing for a long time. I've been practicing for a long time. I can't say this has fully sunk in. Therefore, it can't be stated enough. But it's basically good news because the traditions are not saying go out in the world and find the shiny spiritual thing under a rock somewhere in Tibet. They're all saying that that seeming suffering that vibrantly sucks, if we didn't have our escape hatches, we would know that even more. It ultimately rests on the concept of me. And that which the word me refers to can't be touched is an allegory rather than a reality. That which your name refers to, my name, is an image of a nameless flock of migrating birds for a moment alighting on a tree. That which your name and my name refer to can't quite be clearly designated. But a mind that sincerely looks for itself finds nothing, and that nothing turns out to be everything. So if we wish to utilize spiritual longing, we look into the nature nature of the self. Self Self-image is empty. It's empty. It's a reflection in a mirror. What is the mirror reflected in? What holds up the mirror? May Buddha nature break this mirror and completely relieve me of the burden of myself. That's my deep prayer.
So the polarity I want to <coughs> I want to talk about today is the polarity of agency and surrender, doing and not doing. And in a sense, much of the conflict and confusion and competition for who's wisest among Buddhist schools is related to these notions. I'm not saying that these are two different things, but I'm also not saying they're one thing. Doing and not doing, agency and surrender. But in this world of seemings, these seem to exist and be something that we dance with and that you will encounter in your practice. How hard should I try? But wait, isn't when I really try hard, isn't that me? Isn't that more of the success game, the wanting to stand out game, the wanting the golden now spiritual carrot game? It's not so simple. In the Dharma Reign lineage, they chant, by our own wills and vigilance, may we our fetters cut away. And to say that day after day has an effect. By my own will and vigilance, may I my fetters cut away. <coughs> we could be a person who under or overestimates our ability to cut through by our own power. We may not have fully stepped into just what a force exists within us when we really desire something. Dogen said something I think we can understand. He said, if one was to put as much effort as they do into chasing a romantic partner, into awakening, the matter would be resolved. I think he said something about like a princess, <laughs> based on some old myth, but we undersell uh, the personal power that we have. And I don't know why. We may not like the consequence of fully stepping into our power, the responsibility. We may overestimate our ability to cut through by our own power. And so that very power becomes a place of pride and we're not open, we're not receptive. So we may have a vibrant experience of will and vigilance. We're clear that we want to do this wholeheartedly. With that clarity, I want to do this, and other things are not as important. And I'm not saying that you should feel that way about this, but a vibrant experience of will and vigilance has a lot to do with that kind of paring down. It's hard in the supermarket. I go into the cereal aisle of a grocery store and I just get overwhelmed. I have to pee immediately. There are just too many choices. But when we really decide what we want, like we can see out in the world, people who are very clear what they want, they bring forth a vibrancy of will and vigilance. 
and good old American bootstrap delusion would say, well, isn't that an amazing person? And maybe that's partially true, but what is the source of that vibrant experience of will and vigilance? What's the root of our energies? Materialists might say, well, it's calories, it's sun, it's earth, it's your privilege. But what's the source of those? We are developing in this practice our agency, which is personal power, which is nowness, which is concentration. And they all feed into each other. We are developing it simply by inhabiting, intending. The essence of nowness, concentration, presence is simply the sustenance of an intention. Desire takes the form of mind will pervade body. And that grows both as a skill and as an energetic reality. The more you do it, the more you're able to do it. The more you do it, the more you know you can do it, and you have confidence and know you can do it. And the less you undersell your ability. So it's unusual for people, I'm talking about people, I don't know people. That's bullshit, I don't know people. I suspect it's unusual or we don't often come to full vibrancy, hit the actual limit of our passion as beings for various reasons, one of them being that we hold back. We might have embodied a higher energy state and then felt that we became tense. And that that means that's a bad thing. You could view that as I need to learn to hold higher degrees of energy. So that I'm intense, but not tense. Intensity without tension. Passion without direction. If this speaks to your particular character, then it speaks to your character. And if it doesn't, maybe it doesn't. And that's okay. In the world, agency, concentration is harnessed for mundane means. Usually related to money and power. Sometimes related to some kind of love. Curiosity about life goes a long way in bringing forth the energy to be immersed in something. That's what the koans are tapping. But we are gathering the power of nowness to open to deep wonder. An old master said, between heaven and earth, there's a jewel hidden in the mountain of form. We're gathering the power of nowness to crack open the mountain of form and see the jewel. We do it to cut our fetters away so that we're not a bond slave of the five desires. Do you get what that means? That means that you walk into a place that normally used to pull you with longing and wrench your heart with aversion and you move freely through it. It means you go to a party where previously um, aversion and attraction and judgment so clouded your mind you actually had no fun. People are like, why are you no fun? 
You say it has something to do with the champagne. No, it had to do with your mind. We go to that party and all we have is an open heart that responds. So we do this training for, you could say, for love. For love of all beings. A scattered mind can't hold the wonder. I know a very senior (coughs) Zen teacher who mostly trained in Soto Zen. And later in their practice, they developed concentration. And they said because they learned this only later, because they did not learn how to deeply concentrate, all of the insights that were gifted didn't really penetrate because the mind was not stable enough to hold them. It was like a bucket that had holes in the bottom. And that once they learn to deeply concentrate, those same insights, which once we really taste something, a door is open, penetrated their heart all the more deeply. So a scattered mind can't hold the wonder. A scattered, fractured mind is hindered in love. This nowness, this development of the quality of presence, of agency, means we take and we can take responsibility for our state of mind. So we're back to karma. Observe the externalization habit, how easily we put the onus for our disturbance on the infinite others. How easily we put the onus for the disturbance on the infinite out there's. The reason I keep using rich people as an example because people feel that, well, if everybody had resources and did not need to be afraid of this person or that person, then they would be happy. But I encourage you to observe the rich. Your chosen used to bring home the inquirer. She used, to, she used to buy it and put it on the coffee table in the earlier days of the monastery for that reason. <laughs> observe the externalization habit, but observe through the body of nowness the dignity and peace that's free from that. We don't even know what the externalization habit is until we taste its absence. A lot of things in the Dharma are like that. Don't know, maybe we don't even know what's meant by suffering until it drops away long enough for us to go, oh, now I know what suffering is. Because it boots back up. Shantideva said, and India and Tibet were rough, rough places. To cover all the earth with sheets of leather, where could such amounts of skin be found? But with the leather soles of just my shoes, it is as though I cover all the earth. This is about the equanimity of the Dharma. To cover all the earth with sheets of leather, where could such amounts of skin be found? But with the leather soles of just my shoes, it is as though I cover all the earth. To talk about becoming unified. We're talking about something that's both profoundly simple and not so simple. In this moment, bring your attention into your hands. And hold it there. It 
That's your power. That's your agency. And yet there's not just one desire moving through us. Actually, it's only in a self-centered universe that we would feel that there's only one vector of longing flowing. We have multiple agencies acting in us. We have different streams of conditioning. There's the part of you that just wants to be comfortable. And the logic of inhabiting what doesn't feel good does not compute. That part of us does not get the Dharma. There's part of us that doesn't care what Shanti Deva says. The problem is out there. The room is too X. That person is too Y. No two ways about it. The part of us that is averse basically thinks it's right. There's part of us that, no matter what is presented to it, will reject it with skepticism. And some of you have been trained academically to reject with skepticism. That energy has its use in the Dharma. But the part that doubts doesn't change its mind. If the part that doubts is animating us, then whatever we hear, whatever evidence to the contrary, will just be dismissed. Nah, it's bullshit. It's all bullshit. It's all just an institution to control or whatever probably have a much more creative doubter than me. <laughs> what are the other hindrances? There's sex, anger, sleepiness, sensual desire. I can't remember them all. The point is that lots of things live in us. And my deeper point is, what if there actually is only a single vector of longing? What if it's not that you need to cut some part out of yourself or abandon some good thing or what you love in the name of practice? What if you're doing is just going right to the heart of what those things are all about anyway? The hike, the bar, the job, the security. It can be good to make a vow. It can be good to seal commitment. That's what these robes are and these different garments people wear. Acknowledging we have these forces moving through us. I'm saying parallel, but actually in a lot of ways they're perpendicular. They're at odds. We select what we feel is the wisest, the most beneficent, the, in our best vision of the long term to bring the most truth, beauty, and goodness. We select that and we put energy into it. We ritualize our devotion to way-seeking mind. We're doing that with the chance as we train in session. Trustless thinking won't end on its own. There's this fantasy of catharsis. Like, well, I just need to work all my anger out. No, it doesn't work like that. That's a misunderstanding of karma. Or I just need to, like, have enough sex, and then I'll be able to let go of all that, and then I'll come to the monastery. I've heard versions of this. <laughs> well, there's something to be said for hormones. But do you want to wait till you're like 
in your 60s to come. <laughs> Trustless thinking won't end on its own, so we channel by our own wills and vigilance we cut our bonds. I will make the focus of my life painting. And then from that commitment, I organize around it. Essentially, agency in practice is the power to inhabit what is. And that in itself is a corrective maneuver. You are what is. I am what is. <coughs> what does concentration have to do with that? Even practice makes no sense. You are what is. But as Dogen Zenji said, and yet if there's a hair's breadth deviation, Nirvana becomes samsara. So it's the backward step. It's the coming back into phase with exactly what we already are. And we could say it's on more and more subtle levels. But essentially, Agency, nowness, this side of practice I'm talking about is the power, the intention, the confidence to inhabit what is. You can't leap out of the present moment. As soon as you leap, it's the present moment. You can't escape from nowness. No matter what you do, that's nowness's expression. We encounter the limit of our self-power. We encounter the limit of, I'm going to try really hard. All the strategies just bottom out. They fail us. The dark night of the soul as St. John of the cross expressed it, of course, through Christian language could be seen as what we begin to work with when all of our strategies fail us. And it's good to actually come up against that limit, whether it's some character thing. I remember a time in my training here when I just had this hatred that was like a parasite on my heart. And you couldn't metta sutra that hatred away. And there's nothing I could do about it. To feel the barrier of dualism, to come up against that place where you feel like there's a glass sheet in front of you and the rest of the world. The mind is clear, but somehow hard. That very clarity becomes a bulletproof window. It's good to come up against that. You could say we will come up against that. Self-power can be the barrier in our spiritual practice. I was reading some tales of uh, some old Sufi teachers, and there was a Sufi adept who was renowned and celebrated for talent in practice and teaching and had all the esoteric methods and had mosques full of other Sufis. And he said, the most helpful things were the times when I was humiliated. That's when I was closest to God. In Dharma, everything is kind of upside down and mixed up. 
what's desirable for the worldly heart is not necessarily desirable, desirable for the Dharma heart. Loss is gain. And gain is loss. It gets turned 180 degrees. Fortunate circumstances may just be a new prison. And unfortunate circumstances may be a launching pad for a new vista. It's hard to say. It's all mixed up. My note here says, the delusion of independence, of specialness, of separateness, of being an exception, putting these into the fire of the ancestors. How do you go beyond that which your very going sustains? How can I open to a force outside of myself if I have no idea what that is. It's being in the question. That question itself is the place to start. It's a prostration. It's kneeling in front of an altar and saying, help me with all sincerity. The delusion of independence, of specialness, of separateness, of being an exception. These are some of the things that can happen if self-power becomes well-developed. The medicine then became a poison. So surrender. I have to admit, when I first hear the word surrender in a spiritual context, I kind of feel like I'm going to get to kick back with some cacao in like a velvet bean chair and listen to a harmonium, you know, like, ah, oh, surrender. <laughs> Is that Friday night in the southeast, you know? We're not talking about some kind of jellyfish beanbag thing. Although if you're a really uptight dude, like I especially used to be, that could be very good medicine. <laughs> Cacao in a beanbag. <laughs> Zazen practice is alive. And you could say it's a, <coughs> it's like a pendulum that sometimes we're helping along and sometimes we're slowing down and we discern the limits of effort and when that effort becomes solidifying, when effort is disconnecting us and we learn to ease up and we learn when easing up is a way to slide into fuzziness and daydreaming and disconnection. I don't know what can be said about the deeper level of surrender. If you make it into a new method, oh, I'll go bow to an altar and ask for help. As just a new tool, it may be worse than useless. The spirit of that, now that's something spirit that would fill that kind of practice. We can say something about surrender on this visceral level of doing zazen. Bai Zhang said, the mind does not, what did he say, the mind does not move, the mind does not travel. With mind like mountain, not explaining anything with the mouth, mind not going anywhere, 
then the mind ground becomes like space, wherein the sun of wisdom naturally appears. Another way to say it is, we're not relating to the moment. As long as you're relating to the moment, there will be two. We're letting be as the moment. And in this flavor, being hot and tired is of benefit. Don't relate to the moment. Let be as the moment. Surrender is not disengagement. It's not cruise control. It's not some kind of, oh, my practice is just being that excuses us from the real rough of the spiritual life. Surrender is bodying the body of nowness without thinking that I make that nowness, that I do awareness. Awareness does us. I think surrender is remote from the intellect, but maybe poetry is close. So I'll share a poem with you from one of my teachers. I might have to look for it for a few minutes. Aha. This is called the Temple of Ruin. Tonight we dance in this Temple of Ruin. Footsteps circling like lovesick birds. The hidden companions, seducers of twilight. Tonight we dance in the priory of new dawn. Our bodies prized open by longings revelation like magnolia blossoms on a hot summer's eve. For there is no hiding from heartbreak. There is no way to outrun the messengers of sorrow. And the mind, just a tourist in this Saha realm. But it lives in the deep of your vast. Tonight we dance in this temple of ruin Tonight I dance in the reveries of love. Sorrows outshined in the wanting of my love. And I want the blood red of your delicate kisses. And I want the syllables that fall from your lips. And I want the thirst of a man in the desert. And I want the nakedness of your unflinching kindness. Tonight we dance in the temple of ruin. Laughter mixed with fragments of longing. Thank you, everybody.